and uh, yes, the U.S. Constitution, the original Constitution was Constitution for the United States, if any of you don't remember that. And we're going to sing the bell hymn of the Republic when the Constitution was changed from Constitution for to Constitution of the United States, and the wicked took over our, our land. coming of the Lord. He is trampling up the vintage with the grapes of her stone. He has moved his faithful lightning of his terrible swift soul. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. slavery and guess what they made slaves out of all of us by voluntarily putting us into a system that made us into corporations instead of personal individuals and brought in the maritime law of the seas which Satan loves to play in so now we got a problem and we are solving the problem little by little you know the kingdom and patience of Yeshua the wheel of justice rolls slow but it rolls sure and steadfast and of course I'm going to read about the re-inhabiting of the Republic. This is uh, by Jean and her husband, Jean and David Carl Hurdler, Jean Hello Ann Hurdler from Wisconsin. They were the working with the with the Republic and the press team and helping them to do this. And uh, so we give them honor for doing that. And I but I do to say that they missed putting in 1650 before the Constitution came about, which was in Boston where they were taking oneness Christians, putting them in jail, and uh, they killed them because they wouldn't believe in the Trinity. They believed in one God, one body, one spirit. So in 1650 in America, blood was shed, but it continues back to the cross of those who would teach the truth and teach the real gospel of Yeshua the Messiah, the good news from heaven, the kingdom of Yahweh, the kingdom of Yahushua, the new Jerusalem, the, the same message that fits together with the city, Jerusalem, that heavenly Jerusalem coming down from heaven, the kingdom of God, of Eloi. Instead of the word God, we use the word Eloi. Not Elohim, that's the many gods. Eloi, like he said on the cross, Eloi, 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 why is thou forsaken? He's saying, my God. And God is one. That's what means Eloi. He's not, he's Almighty God, he's not Elohim. The first administration and the first Congress of the Re-Inhabited American Republic, release of chapter 21 of the Re-Inhabited. This was September 22nd, 2015. Chapter 21 continues the story of the Re-Inhabited American Republic while in infancy throughout the first administration and Congress, 2011 through 2012. 
Great personal sacrifice was invested by many who served in the various offices of the three branches of the interim government in both Republic, Republic National as well as the states. The success in setting up the interim governmental structure as the Founding Fathers intended is a testimony to the midnight oil that burned throughout the land. Traces of the spirit of early America were beginning to show character in our modern day posterity, the children of those that started the kind of America. Though not yet fully realizing the truth of our inheritance in the law form, birthed by covenant with the creator of the universe, the ever yearning stride to regain what had been abandoned 150 years earlier was accomplished in spite of growing pains, a devastating enemy blow, and tears amongst the wheat. A hindsight view has proven 2020 vision in gaining understanding of the American Republic's near demise as necessary to shed the spiritual amnesia, get rid of the spiritual amnesia of her true identity, a stepping stone on the path toward the fulfillment of her prophetic destiny. Republic for the United States of America. The rebirth of the Republic. From the genesis of her birth in civil and religious liberty, discovering her identity and national purpose, what made her the mightiest, most blessed nation of, of the earth, to the door opening of the Great Depression that led to her slavery, in the midst of her great apparel, the answer lies in awakening the American people to her identity which leads to the uncovering of the real national treasure, the key to her prophetic destiny. The treasure is handed down to you and us from the forefathers. Act, acting Interim Governor of Wisconsin, Dean Henning's Introduction. The story of the true story of American people and the Republic. This story is the true story of the American people and the Republic which sprang forth from her hearts, from their hearts, it is told as recorded by actual historical events and documents, courage, humility, and character will be needed to read this book in order to fully understand its purpose and glean wisdom from, its, from the past. There is no intent to disparage any nationality, religion, or organization. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalms 119, 165. The sto this story simply brings to light those things, good or bad, which have shaped our thinking and culture to date. No matter how glorious or painful the exposure of this history may be, it is essential for us to know the truth, to be able to recover that which has been lost, stolen or irresponsibly turned over to those with evil intent. For those who seek the truth without prejudice, this record of events and history will be inspiring and liberating to the true reformation of the Republic for the Republic our Founding Fathers bled and died for. This is the story of a people seeking to worship the God of creation, free from the tyranny of man and the bondage of the arch enemy of that Creator. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Ultimately, each individual will have to choose those truths they accept. The purpose of this story is to provide the people with full disclosure the choice is yours. Vice President Dan Owens, that's the, like the president of the corporation, uh, but now this is the president of the republic. Now we have a, a note from the president, James Buchanan Geiger, our real president of the Republic for the United States. He says, I encourage the American people to begin to understand their history and heritage. Reading Reinhabited, the Republic for the United States of America is a good place to begin your journey. Unless we understand our history and what has been lost, then we cannot begin to repair the breach. Gene Herper has labored tirelessly to provide the American people with an accurate historical account of American history, one that has been hidden in plain sight. The documents have been available, up, but until now, nobody had put together such a clearly, easily understood overview. May we all come to place of understanding our past so that we may act appropriately as we work together to repair the breach in the wall. Thank God for people like Gene and David Hurtler who are laying down their lives for the benefit of us all. President Jane Buchanan Geiger. Thank you, David and Gene Hurtler, for making this book and helping the American people that we can come to understand what has happened to our country and what's happening. 
and may more understanding come out from all of it. Understanding, here's a note from the author, Jean Halligan Herbert. Understanding that it is the truth that sets free. It is our sincere intention is to speak the truth in love so that all may be free. Americans know something is wrong but haven't quite figured out what. America's beloved Martin Luther King Jr. said, If we are to go forward, we must go back and rediscover those precious values. So Martin Luther King Jr. said, We must go back and rediscover those precious values that all reality hinges on moral foundations and that all reality has spiritual control. So even America is hinged on the gospel that goes back 2,000 years ago with the crucifixion of the Messiah on the cross where the law was nailed to the tree and you and I were nailed to the tree so that we could have the law fulfilled and the righteousness of God come into us and be a part of this nation. From the desk of the acting governor, uh, this is Wisconsin's great seal. This is the Wisconsin governor of the republic. On this, the 12th, 20th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2014, to my fellow people of God's Republic for Wisconsin. I would like to take this time, they weren't doing this program in Minnesota, but we're going back to Wisconsin, our neighbor right next door. I would like to take this time to, the governor of Wisconsin, I would like to take this time to share my encouragement on the book written and near completion by our own sister in her de jure state of Wisconsin, Jean Hurtler, and with the assistance of her loving husband, David Hurtler, Jean has spent many months praying for the words to come from our Father God that would be put to paper for the people of this great state and our nation to be able to read and edify themselves. It has been an honor and a privilege to have been able to read this book. What an awesome writing that is now being released to the people, we the people. A chapter at a time each week, that is whom we all have been standing and occupying in the vacated seats in the Republic that our forefathers left us to protect. Until we the people wake up and truly understand what has been, what has and is happening in this time in our world. The announcement is as follows, including the links to the document. We got HTTP, you know, semicolon slash less, www.republicofthenitedstates.org slash divine uh, providence. Uh, and then we have dejurestatesofwisconsin.org slash resources.html. Announcing the first chapter, Re-inhabited the Republic for the United States of America. You can go to Republic for the United States of America.org also. The American Republic story from the genesis of her birth in civil and religious liberty, discovering her identity, the national purpose that made her the mightiest and most blessed nation of the earth to the poor opening to the door opening of the great deception that led to her dis her slavery. In the midst of great peril, the answer lies in the awakening of we the people to her identity. Responding in kind, and which then leads to the uncovering of the real national treasure, which holds the key to her prophetic destiny, by Jean Hallahan Hurtler and David Carl Hurtler. When Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the, and published her 1852 anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, it is said that the story fueled the abolitionist movement in making people aware of the truth of slavery. Isn't that precisely where we are now? The time is here for all of us to continue to work together to help the people understand what has been going on for the past many years. Thank you and may God bless you all. Acting Governor Dean Charles Henning, in God's grace and your servant. The Reinhabited Republic for the United States of America, Volume 2, The Story of the Reinhabitation by Jean Hallahan Hurtler with David Carl Hurtler. Volume 2, Foundation History of the American Republic, an amazing biblical parallel along with the consequences of covenant breaking. <clears throat> We're going to st study the history of America now. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant of which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and to thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Acts 3.25 
America is included in that, okay? Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Exodus 19.5 these are things that have to do with the, the foundation of America. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace shall there be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment, with justice, from henceforth forever even forever, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And in the latter end time days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and this kingdom shall not be given unto another people, but it shall break and destroy all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Let everyone take note. All the different religions on the earth, the, the, the Buddhists, the Zionists, the and not, I mean, the, not the Zionists, but the Buddhists, the Hare Krishnas, the Muslims, different people on earth, that God is going to set up a kingdom on earth. That all these kingdoms, that he shall destroy, break and destroy all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever, this kingdom. And that kingdom is the kingdom of Yeshua, the Messiah, who represents Yahweh, who represents the new Jerusalem. Not the old Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, coming up from below. And it includes physical Jerusalem being connected to it, but it has to be sanctified. It has to be holy. And Yeshua makes the kingdom holy and the people in it. America has traditionally been known for many eras for its greatness. Not an arrogant greatness in self-righteous pride, but a biblical type greatness for its humility in acknowledging the creator of the universe in which it had covenant with the adopted laws recorded in his word the Holy Bible as its own. A greatness in being what the early American Puritans had set before themselves, a model of Christian charity. And being that city upon the hill, understanding that the eyes of all people in the world were watching, how they would fare in careful attention to that covenantal relationship with Almighty God. From 1630 sermon, a model of Christian charity by Puritan leader John Winthrop. That was before the Constitution in 1630. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are, are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the way of God, and all professors for, for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. I have a picture here of Governor, Governor Winthrop who desired to make New England as a city upon a hill. He was a governor. He's part of the first government. John Winthrop aboard the Arabella. One of the eleven ships carrying over a thousand Puritans to Massachusetts in 1630. It was the largest initial venture ever attempted in the English New World and granted by charter of the King of, Eng King of England <clears throat> to make a settlement of colonists among the Massachusetts Bay. The Puritans were inspired in their vision to modif model rightful living of biblical standards as they sought to be a, be a beacon to the rest of the world in Christian charity. We shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Keeping Almighty God forefront in all of their ways, carefully holding true to their covenantal relationship with Him, was their insurance to avoid shipwreck as well as the sure way to provide for their posterity. Crossing the expanse of the Atlantic Ocean in the 1600s to the unknown of the wilderness of the New World certainly required great faith. One who contemplates might even imagine that there was a divine hand guiding and directing this great charter in all of the world, in all of time. Over the next 100 years would develop one people in nation 
together in covenant with the creator of the universe, but in other words, one nation under God. Out of the blessings of, of holding true to that covenant came the realization of a national identity and along with it a national purpose. These early Americans, whether they had full revelation of what they were aspiring to or not, were actually en route towards fulfilling a prophetic biblical destiny. The mandate Almighty God had originally given to the father Abraham and his descendants in being a blessing to all the families of the earth. For the first time in many generations was becoming a very possible reality. Now in the New Testament era, the desire to live the scriptures they had learned from the Protestant Reformation, the Puritans desired to live in great humility while exemplifying Christ's words to his disciples that greatness comes through service to others. They understood the counsel of the Old Testament prophet Micah to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Puritans give thanks and reverence to Almighty God. And here was a picture of, of uh, the governor and the people all bow down on their knees. And uh, the governor, John Winthrop. <clears throat> Keeping covenant with Almighty God assured the security of its national borders and also provided an inherent sense of being blessed, that the covenantal obedience to a blessing by extending a helping hand and neighborly service to other nations in need. We helped other nations. The American people came to be known among the nations of the world for placing honor in the highest of regard and was exemplified in its service by its treasured military, its sons and daughters, which selflessly through the generations served with honor God and country. <clears throat> not for self but country honor, courage, commitment Call it. ready to lead, ready to follow never quit semper fidelis, always faithful aim high, fly, fight, win born ready, always ready, always there and almighty God's faithfulness even when those he covenants with are not faithful he has always had a remnant throughout the time that has put him first and has loved him with selfless devotion. And so it was a remnant that broke away from the motherland of Great Britain even before the Puritans ten years earlier. In 1620, the pilgrims came to the New World, referring to themselves as the New Israel, while identifying with Old Testament Israel in crossing the expanse of the Atlantic as they sought the freedom to worship Almighty God according to the scriptures they had learned in the Protestant Reformation. The Pilgrim's Mayflower Compact was written in 1620 and was the first governing document of these people as a new covenant for the new world. The Pilgrim's... Okay, I just read that. The Pilgrim's signing of the compact on board the Mayflower on November 11, 1620, painted by T.H. Matheson. That was the picture that I have here. It's too small to put on. And so again, the rem remnant known as the Puritans had followed st suit, making a covenant with Almighty God. The Puritans in 1630 were guided by a model of Christian charity in their declaration of the crown rights of Yeshua Messiah. And then the founding fathers and the mothers who birthed, birthed forth this nation in covenant with Almighty God through the Declaration of Independence, acknowledging the creator of the universe and the supreme judge of the world while stipulating a firm reliance upon him for divine protection. They understood the depths of the meaning of liberty. Let me read that again. They understood the depth of the meaning of liberty. You know, the Dark Ages wasn't too far before that. Because they knew intimately the persecution and bloodshed it took to achieve it. They knew it was God-given, but that they must re be responsible to take action through faith to secure that liberty as un unalienable. So you see all the experiences back in Europe, all the persecutions, the inquisitions, the things that were going on, they were, were, were committed in their heart to maintain this liberty by following with God 
and they called the, the, the liberty as unalienable. You can't take away the liberty uh, to serve God. To serve God is to have all your time for God. You, you get your work done so you got time for more time for God and more time to do the good works of the scriptures of the gospel. It was considered as a sacred, sacred duty to preserve liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience. Today, the conscience, a lot of people's conscience are burned with a hot iron, and they've gone away from God, gone away from this liberty conscience. As key to their relationship with the Creator through their Protestant faith in what was described as a religion of liberty. And when it talks about Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, it's, it's talking about one religion, the Judeo Christian religion, not talking about other religion. People came here and lied and said, Oh, America is for all these other religions. No, we, were to, we wanted to help people. But that doesn't mean we're, the liberty is for them. It's not designed for them. Even the Bible teaches that. That the wicked cannot find liberty. They can steal it only. They can't create it. They can try to create it. Then they're doing righteous deeds while at the same time being wicked. You can be half wicked and half righteous, but that's not good according to the growing of a tree or the growing of eternal life. At the birthing of the nation, the American revolutionary leader Patrick Henry had said, and remember Patrick Henry warned about the legislation becoming smaller and smaller people with more and more power in government because we were, our democratic side was weak where the republican side was strong. They had two members from each, from each state and they were very strong because they, they weren't many people, those uh, representatives. But now the democratic side brought out many representatives, amen? And they were not going to be growing as the population grew. Patrick Henry warned about that. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by the Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Yeshua the Messiah, who was based on the Judeo-Christian. That's what this nation was founded on. For this very reason, peoples of the other faiths have been afforded asylum. They gave them help for these, for Buddhists and for Muslims and different people. It's a place for them to, to get away from persecution. Prosperity and freedom of worship here. But it doesn't mean that they are creating that liberty. The Christians were creating the liberty. The early Americans well understood their identity in Yeshua the Messiah, the creator of the universe. They experienced a living faith in Messiah who had given them the gift of righteousness that made self-government possible, which is true liberty. That is why the creator came into the world as savior and in preaching forth the and established of the kingdom, where there's no robbing and killing and destroying, they were able to bring forth the nation. Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, preached his kingdom. As his first coming was prophesied in his word, the Holy Bible, so was it prophesied that his kingdom shall be increased and have no end. In the mid-1700s, between the end of the Puritan era and the first stirrings of independence, Jonathan Edwards, the third president of, the, of Princeton University and a Puritan preacher was used mightily of God in a revival known as the First Great Awakening. This Great Awakening was actually a reawakening of the deep national desire for the covenant way of life. This longing did not die with the passing of the Puritan era, but only went dormant. So the, 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 there was re-establishing the desire to, to maintain this covenant with God and to maintain this freedom that had been taken out of many persecutions in Europe where people were burned on the stake and put on the rack and stretched and all kinds of torture devices to get them to confess to obey the, the Pope and the Catholic Church and not to obey the Bible itself. Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a sermon preached at Enfield July 8, 1741, by Reverend Jonathan Edwards. Reverend Edwards believed that America was the isle prophetically refer, referenced in Isaiah 69. That would be the land in the latter days where God would regather the descendants of the ancient Israelites and the plan and disposition of providence for these people to play a significant part in the communicating the blessings of the kingdom of God to the Jewish people as well as the rest of the world he also preached about a parallel of ancient Israel and the American people. Edwards stated, 
a deliverance. Oh, he stated many sermons were preached at the period of time about America's national purpose and destiny. A deliverance out of the hand of the kingdom of Syria is often used by the prophet Isaiah as a type of the glorious deliverance of the church from her enemies in the later days. Most of them pro projected the belief that this new nation was the fifth kingdom, the stone kingdom. Prophesied by the Old Testament prophet Daniel, America was designed to complete the work that the Reformation had begun and smash the feet of the Babylonian image and, and bring liberty and justice for all to the whole world. This was the original American dream. Our national purpose, it was not secular, but neither did it establish a religion. It establishes God and his word as king and put all men and religions under his authority. The image of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the succession of, of oppressive world empires from ancient Babylon to the present mystery of Babylon as prophesied by the Old Testament prophet Daniel. The stone that was cut out without hands strikes Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's corporate image, Daniel chapter 2. Europe was hopelessly rooted in monarchies and feudalism, but America had shed those tyrannical ideas. The spiritual stir would burst forth an unquestionable desire that would produce a new generation of clergymen who would help to prepare America to fight for her life in the coming war for independence. Uh, we can see if I can take, a, take this paper. I'll see if I can show it on, on YouTube here. So I can get it on the camera, get some of the vi visual of that. We'll explain some of this in a minute here. One of the, one of the people's saints for, for the defender of liberty, it says on the bottom, it says, uh, all of the people's saints for the calendar of liberty, 1852. And we see this, the snake, dragon, Catholic Church with the bear and other things on the left here, the beasts. You see the kind of things that the that the priests hold, these poles and stuff. And then we see Liberty Man writing on this uh, the sword says eloquence. Truth, it says on the shield truth. One of the people's saints for the calendar of liberty, eighteen fifty two. And that's just one of the people's saints, this guy right with the calendar, I mean with the shield and the sword, and slaying the dragon there, see the dragon, the false church and all that. And then there's a woman looking up, lifting her hands up, and the dragon's got her, his claws on his, her knee, got his claw on her knee, that dragon picture. And there's people in the background with one of those soldiers at 1793, right to the background there. So we'll put that back in the folder here. Thought I'd give you a little picture of that. And it's gonna, in the back of it, we can read about it. The address registers the widespread American sympathy with certain revolutionary movements in, here in Europe. More specifically, the print extols Louis Kosev, the Hungarian patriot who led in, in 1848 revolt against the Austrian imperial dominion of Hungary. Kosa's center comes to the aid of liberty, fallen at the left, against Austria. Wow, that's what that thing is. Which is shown as the three-headed monster. The monster represents the alliance of the throne and altar, the monarchy and the papacy. Its three heads are those of a dragon with clerical hat and papal tyra, the Vatican, a wolf, with a crown, Austria, and a bear with an eastern crown, probably Russia, Austria's ally, ally. Around the monster's neck is a pendant with the Jesuit insignia. Kosip steps from a railing into the ring, wielding the sword of eloquence and confronting the monster with a shield of truth, which reflects the face of a prelate, probably Pope Pius IX. Kosis also carries a flag with a liberty cap surrounding by stars, the liberty cap being just above his head. The hero is cheered on by representatives of various nations, waving their respective flags and watching from behind the railing. These include left to right, 
an American, an Italian, and a Frenchman who carries the flag of the Revolution of 1793. Liberty, meanwhile, has fallen. Her sword lay broken on the ground, while her left foot still presses on the monster's tail. She raises her hand towards Kosith in an imploring gesture. The Liberty of Congress impression of the print is inscribed with a note, probably contemporary, in pencil saying, fight for us. So Liberty was that woman down at the bottom, and this guy from Austria is fighting the, the, the beast. When God pours out his spirit in a major way, he seldom concentrates on just one area. He fires of revival. The fires of revival were also fanned to flame throughout England by a young preacher known as George Whitefield, 1714 to 1770. George Whitefield. As the pulpits of Bristol, England were closed to him by jealous pastors, Whitefield began to preach in the open. Burdened for those in less fortunate and perhaps loathsome lifestyles, he would draw crowds by thousands in open-air preaching, resolved to bring them the gospel of Yeshua the Messiah. Tens of thousands are reported to have experienced new life in their conversions all throughout England. A picture of George Whitfield preaching on the Word and Spirit, 1749. Whitfield came to a belief or realization that he was called of God to his friends, General James Orth, Oleg Thorpe's new colony in America, Georgia. He was anxious to join his Christian friends in America because he dared to trust that his preaching might help create one nation under God, 13 scattered colonies united with each other. Under Whitfield's anointed preaching, Americans throughout the colonies were beginning to discover a basic truth which would be significant foundation stone of God's new nation and which by 1776 would be declared as self-evident that in the eyes of their creator, all men were created of equal value by the sovereign act of Almighty God and through the obedience of a few dedicated men, the body of Messiah was indeed forming in America. Throughout the almost universal and simultaneous experience of the Great Awakening by the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, Americans began to become aware of themselves as a nation, a body of believers, which had a national identity as a people chosen by God for a specific purpose. They were to be, they were to be not only a city upon a hill, but a genuine citadel of light in the darkened world. As the pilgrims and Puritans had seen the, and experienced it, but had now all passed on and gone home to glory, it seemed as though the vision of the covenant relationship had died with them. You remember that Christmas was unlawful in America in the beginning? Now, throughout, now through the shared experience of coming together in large groups to hear the gospel of Yeshua Messiah, Americans were rediscovering God's plan to join them together by His Spirit in the common cause of advancing His kingdom. And further, they were returning to another aspect of His plan. They were to function in a covenanted nation, not as an isolated individual colonies. The land had been awakened again, and now the land was a giant and a growing of one at that. It is a matter of God's timing in all things and always accord according to his unfolding prophetic word. The Lord, through the preaching of this covenanted man, George Whitfield, was uniting the 13 colonies in such a profound and deep way that few people even realized at first what was happening. Where, wherever Whitfield traveled, he was preaching the same gospel and the same Holy Spirit was quickening the message in people's hearts regardless of their denomination. All were accepting the same Christ in the same way. He was the first man to cut across denominational barriers. At the same time, geographical barriers became no more significant than denominational ones. They were beginning to discover a basic truth which would be a chief foundation stone of God's new nation, and which by 1776 this phenomenal movement of faith swept across, swept the American colonies, helping to unite them prior to the Revolutionary War. This revival, which lasted about 25 years, left a permanent impact on American Protestant church members, resulting from powerful preaching that gave listeners a sense of a deep personal relation of their need of salvation by faith in Yeshua the Messiah. 
This monumental social event brought with it a move away from ritual and traditionalism in religion and made it more intensely personal by stressing a relationship with the living Lord. For the average church member, this awakening fostered a deep sense of spiritual conviction and redemption, and by encouraging self-examination, along with a commitment to a new standard of personal morality. It appears as the design of heaven in orchestrating the people of God to be drawn into covenant renewal with him on this rich promised land flowing with milk and honey and which would soon produce the fruit of expansion across the continent as he shed his grace from sea to shining sea. Ahead would unfold his plan to create his government on earth for a people in a nation belonging to him. He requires his people to participate in his plans. Although the author of the universe will work through whom, whoever and whatever he chooses in his divine plan, there is a special part for those who fully surrendered and filled with his spirit. His devote, devoted sons and daughters are compelled by his spirit, enabling them to move heaven on earth, or on earth as it is in heaven, in participating in the unfolding of his prophetic word and the dominion mandate to be, to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. America experienced a second great awakening beginning in 1826 when the nation was awakened with the fact that the enemy of the American Republic had snuck inside through a secret societies along with their titles of nobility and their Luciferian religion. Because of this awakening and national repentance, there was an encounter of an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit which brought a deep spiritual renewal in America. Americans held the conviction that no, to covenant their fellow citizens to Christianity was an act that simultaneously saved souls and saved the Republic. Knowing well their history, they, they knew founding Father John Adams had warned his fellow countrymen, stating, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. The Constitution, so when the Marine Corps and the Navy and the Army and the Air Force, they swear allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, no, no, it's the Constitution for the United States. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You, John Adams, the statesman. U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Joseph Story, 1779 to 1845, was also a professor at Harvard Law School, 1821 to 1845. He wrote tremendous influential works, including commentaries on the Constitution. In his commentary of the First Amendment's original meaning, Justice Story ensures there is not a truth to be gathered from history more certain or more momentous than this, that civil liberty cannot long be separated from religious liberty without danger and ultimate without destruction to both. Wherever religious liberty exists, it will first or last bring in and establish political liberty. There is no liberty without religious liberty. Is what he's saying there. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story. That's when the Supreme Court was doing good and not following Satan. Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story. In May 1854, Congress of the United States of America passed a resolution in the House of Representatives which declared, The great vital and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or Yeshua the Messiah. Capital of the United States of America, 1846, is a picture over here. Because of the national sin in breaking covenant with Almighty God, by not following through with its Declaration of Independence, its national birth certificate that declares that all men were created equal, we have a birth certificate, all men are created equal, the bondage can only increase until the American people cry out to Almighty God for deliverance and jubilee. She is yet to be awakened to her prophetic destiny as a city upon a hill, in fulfilling her call to be a blessing to all the families of the earth by proclaiming the way of true liberty. 
America has an important role in the divine plan, though we acknowledge that she is only part of the kingdom of God as a universal kingdom. <clears throat> we encourage everybody to become more patriotic in, in serving God and country. Much of America, including the church, had fallen asleep with eyes veiled. They accepted the 501c3 gag order, were enticed and secularized with the doctrine of Balaam, and cursing themselves and their posterity through idolatry and anything that they would worship in place of Almighty God. America, America began to lose her identity when the pulpit ceased to prick her conscience. Founding Father and America's second president, John Adams, declared, It is the duty of the clergy to accommodate their discourses to the times, to preach against sins as are most prevalent, and recommend such virtues as are most wanted. President John Adams. The president says it's up to the ministry to reprove the people in the country that are doing wrong and to recommend virtues as are most wanted, that are needed. And I encourage people to read the Proverbs every day, to study the Proverbs, to get the treasures out of the Bibles to help America and its people. Uh, John Adams declared, enslaving the black race and in mistreating of the native first Americans, America had plagued itself and its posterity with the curses of disobedience. As pointed out earlier in the American Republic's history, the earliest of Americans made covenant with Almighty God and viewed themselves in parallel with Old Testament Israel. In light of this profound history and in parallel with biblical patterns, one might contemplate a response of Almighty God by his, by his raising up a modern day or new Babylon to discipline America, just he has, as he has done in the Old Testament times with King Nebuchadnezzar in conquest and establishing his kingdom known as Babylon. As Almighty God has throughout time raised up other nations or people as his rod of correction for his own people, the conquering people have their own ungodly agenda, which unknown to them God uses for his own purposes. So the corporation that took over America is actually creating a, a more biblical people that are going to come up out of America. In biblical contemplation, we would think of the new modern-day Babylon prophetically as Mystery Babylon, as stated in the book of Revelation. We think of the word mystery because of this, its secret or hidden government, as the names of corporations at law are spelled in all capital letters. We make note of the precise spelling of mystery and Babylon. In the book of Revelation, specifically in chapter 17, nothing takes Almighty God by surprise. In fact, he loves to reveal his secrets to those who reference him and to lovingly assure them that he is true, truly omniscient. He knows everything. Mystery Babylon indeed came into power when de facto President Woodrow Wilson signed into law the Federal Reserve Act, which had been enacted covertly in December 1913. This put America into financial captivity to the powerful banking cabal families who owned the Federal Reserve Bank. This put America on a collision course with destiny because it was designed to be only a matter of time before the bankers owned everything and everyone. The bondage can only increase until the American people cry out to Almighty God for deliverance and jubilee. She is yet to be awakened to her prophetic destiny as a city upon a hill, in fulfilling her call to be a blessing to all the families of the earth by proclaiming the way of true liberty. America has an important role in the divine plan, though we acknowledge that she is only part of the kingdom of God as a universal kingdom. Much of America, including the church, has fallen asleep. With eyes veiled, they, ex they accepted the 501c3 gag order, were enticed and secularized with the doctrine of Balaam, and cursing themselves and posterity. Founding Father and American President John Adams declared, the duty of the clergy to accommodate the discourses, to accommodate their discourses to the times, to preach against such sins as are most prevalent, and recommend such virtues as are most wanted. We need to go back to the Republic, I know that. President James Adams, second president of the United States, 30, uh, birthday of John Adams, let's see, Paris Church, both Adams and his son, President John Quincy Adams, 
are buried at the church. Adams was one of the leading advocates for the creation of the Continental Navy. He drafted the first set of rules and regulations for the new Navy. He was able to convince the Congress to pass an act providing a naval armament, which was less than he thought was necessary, but at least provided for the equipping of three frigates. The Constitution, these are boats, the Constitution, the United States, and the Constellation, U.S. Navy photo. In God's grace, we, he has always preserved a remnant to himself. He remains faithful to his covenant, even when others are not. His prophetic word will not return void. He preserved a remnant with a flame of true patriotism that remained within the small core of Americanism. The Sacred Fire of Liberty Carried Forward, Chapter 2. I'm going to go into that a little bit. We're getting close to the end. We've got seven minutes left, folks. Okay. By the honorable members of the military armed services and passed to awakened American patriot leaders. The Sacred Fire of Liberty, Colossal Hand and Torch Liberty, 1876. Those closest to understand duty, honor, and commitment to God and country, those who took a lifetime oath to the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, we've got to remember we've got a fake Constitution. Constitution of is a fake one. Constitution 4 is the real one. The supreme law of the land, the military, have always had Christian patriots amongst their ranks who have passionately held the torch of liberty. Those faithful patriots have been awakened for decades with knowledge that the enemy was lurking within as they could smell a rat in a woodpile. In duty and honor, they have done their best to pass the liberty torch by teaching their subordinates the true American heritage while also training them in the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. And the Constitution 4 is the supreme law of the fake maritime law. Not the real merit of the, 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 the imposters. We call to your attention one such honorable gentleman, Carl Miller, a highly decorated hero of the Vietnam War. Mr. Miller, Miller served in several operations where he was many times seriously injured and reports having miraculously escaped death numerous times. He credits divine intervention and Almighty God's providence for preserving his life so that he may complete the most important mission of his life, that of teaching others the importance of the Constitution, its meaning, and how to preserve it. While serving in Vietnam, Mr. Miller was inducted into the top secret project, Blue Book, where certain of his superior officers will pull aside their top soldiers and teach them duty, honor, country, and pride in the corpse, while also using them history and various teaching them history and various kinds of programming that was taking place in the U.S. government. They were taught the Constitution to the degree that they were required to be able to recite it just as they would any manual of arms. Mr. Miller advises that this program took place totally top secret in order to, in order to not offend any chains of command or incur any presidential problems similar to what happened with General MacArthur. Mr. Miller explains that these honorable military officers jeopardized their careers in order to achieve the results of their men being instilled with these core items and the ability to carry forward the torch of liberty. Mr. Miller also advises that this top secret project was conducted in many of the military services in Vietnam, as, such as the Marine Corps, Air Force, and the Army. As a civilian, Mr. Miller has carried forth duplication of his training, in which he describes all he describes as transferring the flame that was instilled to him to other Americans. We salute Mr. Miller and all the other loyal patriotic servicemen, women and officers, for their faithfulness to God and country. We understand that there was a great price paid to carry the torch of liberty, one that has ensured the flame of liberty to endure today. With a very deep sense of gratitude, we thank you, sons and daughters of the Republic. And you can go see a park bench on uh, uh, Fort Snelling, out by the airport. And it says, to the sons of the Republic, it was put on there by the daughters of the Republic. It's a park bench overlooking the river there, not far from the, uh, from the, the not the roundhouse, but this side of it, north of it. 
past the barracks, you know, the end of the barracks, well, the big building barracks anyway. Very deep sense of gratitude, we thank you, sons and daughters of the Republic, sons and daughters of the Almighty God. One day in the not too so distant future, you will surely hear our Creator tell you, well done, my good and faithful servants. This story serves as a threshold in going forward in time and bringing into light that it is the same gender of honorable and faithful military leaders who seek to end the insane spiral towards World War III as being orchestrated by the cunning, ambitious, unprincipled men, as President George Washington referred to them, while also desiring to alternative, desiring an alternative to a corporate CEO as their commander. George Washington in military service, Washington receiving a salute on the field of Trenton. They were tired of taking dangerous orders that bring their colleagues, friends, and their military family into harm's way around the world for reasons they were well aware were to enrich the pocketbooks of a few banking cartel oligarchs in the world. They were well understood that the CEO of the corporate United States has no legitimate place in governing of the United States of America. That would be President Trump today. They have no business being where they're at. They had an earnest desire to re-inhabit all of the original Constitutional Republic given to us by our forefathers, and they have been preempted from governance, having nurtured the flame of liberty. For many years, the time was ripe, and their plan was lawful to bring remedy to all these regards. It was in 2010 when the objectives of the plan to restore America was brought forward by these honorable military leaders and discussed with awakened American leaders in the patriot community who had also spent years in research. These leaders and lovers of liberty realized that Congress had never repealed the original constitutional republic. You see, even the military is behind the restoration of the republic. And it's a slow wheel that's turning, folks, because they have to get rid of all the devils, right? Throughout careful studies, they were enlightened in understanding that the original American republic had been suspended in 1860 to 1861 at the period of time of the inception of the Civil War. The honor, honorable military leaders, lovers of liberty, discovered that the original Constitutional Republic had been shoved aside into dormancy when the House Union was divided. The cunning, ambitious, unprincipled men that President Washington had warned about in his farewell address had indeed crafted a plan in their counter-reformation agenda. They well understood that a House divided cannot stand. And this is what we're going to go into more in the future, folks, on we're going to study the, the American Republic's rehabilitation, and the program is almost over with, folks. Um, we had a picture of Benjamin Franklin here uh, coming up next on the next program. We'll get we'll get it back into the book, folks. In the meantime, let's pray that more and more people will come to the Republic for the United States .org and study what's been going on and sign the Declaration of Independence themselves. It doesn't have to be just a few people, you know, we can all sign it, the original documents of America, and get our lawful birthright back, and, and get rid of this de facto government that's over us, and get rid of the Federal Reserve, which is Trump is in the, Trump is in the midst of doing, even though he's the head of a corporation, he's working with the Republic to turn it back over to the Republic, and we're over with.